morning. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Thank you, Emily. Looks like it's just you and me. Yeah, for a second, I was checking my email to see if class got canceled. Oh, I, I, I understand. Yes, I, I was a bit slack last, last week. Well, not slack, just, yes. <laughs> oh, I just meant because I was the, I didn't see anyone else. Oh, fair enough, I get it, Emily. Well, there is no class on Wednesday, just be aware of that. Okay, that's thank because, you. That's because it's Veterans Day. Yeah. No classes for anybody, anywhere, any, not just me. I hope you can have some friends here soon. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just continue as, as is. Yeah, we got somebody else. All right, looks like it is 9.30. We will get started here. I just want to remind you where we were at here and also to remind you very importantly that there is no class on Wednesday. This is uh, due to Veterans Day. No classes for anybody at the college. It's just a holiday. So please be aware of that. All right, let's take a look at, well, we were taking a look at hybridization and just to just to summarize what I had said last time about hybridization. The reason we talk about hybridization is that we need to be able to explain shapes and the shapes are going to be explained by the combination of different orbitals. In our cases, we're talking about S, P and in some cases D for the bigger ones like the five and the six. So the total groups here will determine what kind of hybridization we're going to be dealing with. So two groups, S, P, you'll notice when we add S and P together, that's one and one, that's two. For trigonal, we've got S, P, two, that's a combination of one S and two P orbitals. For, for tetrahedral, that's four, that's one S and three Ps. For five, one S, three Ps and a D because there's only three Ps. And once we get to five and six, we're talking about molecules that are so large that we can actually access the D orbital in order to make the hybrids happen. But we can't do a fourth P orbital because there isn't one. So we need a fifth orbital, so we grab it from the D. And in the case of octahedral, we do SP3D2. So that would be one S, three Ps and two Ds, but a total of six overall in order to make that specific kind of hybrid. So if you, Recall what I was talking about the other day, the hybrids are exactly that. They're uh, combinations of S and P orbitals. And you'll notice the SP3 looks a lot more like a P orbital than it does an S orbital, which makes sense because it's one part S, three parts P. And if you remember my analogy there, I was looking at vodka and orange juice, one part vodka, three parts orange juice, that kind of thing. And if you look at uh, the comparison of the shapes here, you can see the SP2 looks a little more, well, it looks a little less P-like, I suppose. It becomes a little bit shorter and fatter until we get down to the S and P, which is sort of an exact hybrid. You know, it's a true hybrid. It's S and P together, 50% each. And the resulting orbitals that we get do look like a combination of S and P orbitals, short and fat, but also, having some P character as well. But the most important thing that I want you to re be aware of here is the link between the overall shape, because we can get that fairly easily, and how many hybrids we need in order to achieve that shape. Anyway, I'll go into more of that once we, once we go through some examples. 
The next thing I want to talk about here is the concept of dipoles. And what I mean by dipoles is the, it's electron distribution in a molecule. It's which way the, the electrons are kind of going or are very attracted to in a way. And you can treat it sort of like a little magnet, I suppose. It's a way of, way of dealing with it. And as we'll see later when we get into intermolecular forces, these dipoles can have an effect on how these molecules interact with each other. And that can in turn affect things like boiling point. And we will be looking at those kinds of effects a little bit later. So this dipole stuff is going to be of use to us uh, later on as well. Now a dipole, in and of itself is really just a, a way of showing where the electrons are attracted to or where the electrons are, are going to be pulled towards. So when you've got two elements, A and X, and they're bonded together, what happens is that the electron can be closer to one of the atoms than the other. And what we know as a rule of thumb What we know as a rule of thumb is that the electrons will always be attracted to the side that has or the atom has the greater electronegativity. So let's say I've got, I've got those two examples down the bottom here, H and F. Let's have a look at those. Now we know that F is the most electronegative element. And what that means is if we were to draw what the bond looked like, it would look kind of like this. There's two electrons in that bond. And because F is more electronegative than H, what we're going to find is that the electrons overall are going to be closer to the F than they are to the H. This is what creates the dipole. The fact that the electrons are closer to one element than the other. I want to remind you how easy it is to determine which element is more electronegative. And what I'm talking about here is I'm going to have to go back to the course here. I will pick up a periodic table here just to remind you how we can determine. Determine what the relative electronegativity is. Let's see, find one here. Let's see. I know I have one in practice test four, so I'll pull that up. We'll need it anyway. All right, so looking at a periodic table, we have one here. What we do is we look at F. So whichever element is closest to F out of two elements, that's always going to be the one that is more electronegative. That's always going to be the one to which the electrons will be more attracted. I'll say that again. That will always be the element to which electrons are more attracted. Does anybody have any questions so far? Not that I have at the moment, no. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I don't have one. I was just- Oh, okay, thank you. Trying to contribute. <laughs> um, what's that? I was just trying to uh, fill the blank space of the empty just table. Yeah. Sorry, it looks like it's- yeah. I'm lost, I've lost connection here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I think I got you back now. Sorry about that. Hit the wrong button on my speaker. All right. So going back to going back to where we were at. Oh, 
So for any element, and uh, that's what I've got here in, the, in this slide. So I've got A and X, and if X is more electronegative than A, then the way we express this is to have the delta minus on the X and the delta plus on the A. And when I say delta plus and delta minus, it's a pretty accurate reflection of what I've got in this diagram. So what I'm saying is that we have delta minus on the F, we have delta plus on the H. And this is just because the electrons on average are closer to the F than they are to the H. These charges are called partial charges. They're not full charges. Partial, that's what they are. Does anybody have any questions? So the, the way we can express the dipole, which is really just a, an idea, an arrow that shows where the electrons are being pulled towards, is what we do is we draw the arrow always towards the more electronegative of the two elements. And then we put a little vertical line at the end. If you, if you look closely at this vertical line, what it looks like. See how it kind of looks like a plus? And then the arrow here is showing where the electrons are pulled towards. So this is again a, a direct correlation between where the electrons are, the electronegativity, and then these partial charges as well. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so if you look at the two, the other example I've got up here, which would be O and H. Again, if I, if I draw where the electrons are, O is more electronegative than H. So the electrons are closer to the O than they are to the H. So it'd be delta minus on the O, delta plus on the H. And then the arrow that we draw to show the dipole looks like that. So the arrow goes towards the O and then we put a little vertical line here on the H end. And then all we're showing, that, that, that don't overthink this, the arrow is just showing where the electrons are kind of pulled towards. All right, that's, that's, that's all I'm trying to show you here. Okay, any questions? You can't hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Can I have some? Yes, you can hear. Indication that somebody hears me. Yes, please. Can hear yeah, you. can you hear us? Thank you. I think somebody did. Let's have a look. Yeah. I uh, I can't hear you. That's the problem. Oh. Yeah. Okay. That's the problem. All right. Let me let me see what's going on here. I seem to have lost lost a connection here. I can't hear you. All right, let's try this again. Sorry, I'm just, just trying to get this thing connected properly. For some reason, I won't. All right, let me turn it on and turn it back on again. All right, can somebody speak, yes. please? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm not hearing you. I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to disconnect this and all. Plug in my headset. Um. 
Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I can hear you now. That's good. All right. Sometimes that uh, output setting on like Zoom is set to default somewhere else. So you might have to do internal settings on the Zoom. I might have to, yeah. It, it usually doesn't though. It usually just goes directly to that once the Bluetooth set up. But for some reason today, it just wasn't working. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 take, I take your advice there. Thank you. No problem. All right, so once we've, once we've determined one dipole or one set of dipoles, then what we can do is we can begin to add dipoles together. And this is where things get a little bit more difficult. If anybody's done any calculus, then they are aware at least of the, the concept of vector addition. And that's effectively what we're doing here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach it more as a uh, just sort of look at it kind of way to determine which way the dipole is going. When you've got more than one dipole in a molecule, you need to be able to add them together and, and figure out the net direction. You know, what happens when you add these things together? Which, which direction is the dipole actually going? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, I'm not really going to show you too much about the concept of, of vector addition in and of itself. But what I am going to do is, is show you just a couple of pieces of guidance that can, that can help you out. There's really only two cases that we need to be aware of here. All right, let's say we've got two dipoles and they happen to be going in the exact opposite directions, like this. And well, I'm trying to make, let, let, me, let me be a little bit more exact with that. I want to make them the same size. So when you've got two dipoles going in the exact opposite direction, they're the same size, what happens is they cancel out. So the net dipole, when you add these two dipoles together, is effectively zero. Now, if you take two dipoles, so you have to take into account two things, the direction and the, and the size, but when they're the same size, that they're just going to cancel out if they're traveling in the exact opposite direction. But if, you're, if you've got two dipoles, they're traveling in a similar direction, like these, but these are both sort of traveling towards the, the right side here. When you add them together, we get a dipole that looks like this. So you'll notice that the dipole kind of goes directly in between them, but in that same general direction. And really that's all I'm trying to show you here. If the dipoles happen to be going in the opposite direction, both to the left, and the net dipole would look like this, it would be generally to the left, but again, pretty much straight in between the two dipoles that we're looking at. If you've done any calculus, then this will look very familiar to you. If you've done any physics, this should look somewhat familiar to you as well. But if, uh, if not, then this is a good sort of introduction here into a little bit of a vector addition. But that's pretty much all I really wanted to, to show you as far as how to handle these kinds of situations. Does anybody have any questions that can help them with this? So basically you're just seeing the, where the electrons are being pulled to. Yes, on an overall basis, an additive okay. basis, right? That's what, I mean, that's what we're trying to get a, get a picture of here. Right, so I've got two cases that, I've, that I'm showing you here on the slide where you've got A, an element, and then you've got X, another element. In the first case, the A is more electronegative than the X. So when we draw the dipoles, we always draw them exactly parallel to the bond as well. That's important too. And you'll notice that the arrows point towards A and I'm just saying A is the more electronegative of these two elements. So when we add those two dipoles together, we get one that goes directly in between them and points outwards or upwards here in this instance. When X is more electronegative than A, then the dipoles go in the 
exact opposite direction, but towards the X in both instances. And then we add those two together and we end up getting a dipole that goes sort of uh, downwards here, directly in between the two dipoles. On a three dimensional level, it becomes a little bit more difficult to, to determine this, but it does follow a very similar kind of pattern. What I'm trying to show you here by showing these bonds, you'll notice that I've got a straight line here. What I'm trying to say there is that AX bond is actually in the plane of the paper or in the plane of the screen. The wedge here, this solid wedge, is an indication that the X bond is coming out from the screen. And this dash bond here is an indication the X is going into the screen. So the actual overall dipole here is one that travels in between all three and directly and down through the middle of the molecule. That's a bit harder to visualize. So to help you with that, what I recommend you do is let's go, actually I'm going to access preview here. I'm going to show you another one of my videos here, which I think it's a decent video. I think it's, I think it really helps with the whole visualization of these dipoles. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this. I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'll just show you a little bit of it. I think it's pretty cool. Where are we? Here we have dipoles. All right, give me a second here. I'm going to change your change your share here. Okay. Talk to you about dipoles and that dipole. The only dipole we're going to see. Okay, so let's see. So I go into a bit of a blurb here about what dipoles actually are. And now this is where I start to explain how to add the dipoles together in a in three-dimensional space, which is really helpful for the whole for the whole point of this. Let's take a look first of all at SO2. If I drew a, a dipole, the first thing I would want to do is draw dipoles along the bonds. So in the case of S and O, O is more electronegative than S because it's closer to fluorine in the periodic table. So when we draw these two dipoles, you can see we draw them from the S down to the O and parallel to the SO bonds. It doesn't matter that they're single or double bonds. That's, that lacks any importance. You'll also notice I don't draw any dipoles towards the non-bonding electron pairs. And the reason for that is because dipoles are strictly for bonds, not, and not something that doesn't bond. Does anybody have any questions so far? And I would, oh. first of all, also... Sorry? Oh, no, I don't. I was just trying to respond. Okay. okay, thank you. I want to see which out of O and S was more electronegative. So what I do is I go to... Anyway, I show all that. That on. means I can draw two dipoles along here. And the dipoles will be drawn from the S towards the O in both instances. Now, the dipoles will also have the same magnitude because I'm drawing them to the same atom. Now the other thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to look at this and try and tell which direction the net dipole will be going in. Now the net dipole will be a combination of these two dipoles. Now we can do this by using the concepts of vector addition, which I'm not going to be looking to. We'll go direction you think. Alright, so now I'm going to show you and what, what that I'm going looks to try like. and do is draw the uh, draw the dipoles on this diagram here. And again, we're saying that this is an S and this is an O, so that dipole will be there. And this dipole will be here. So that's the individual dipoles for the for the bonds. Now let's look at the net dipole, and the net dipole is going to go straight down here and in between and straight through the center of the molecule. So that's going to be... 
So this one, so that was for SO2. This one was for H2O, where O is more electronegative than H. And again, you can see the, the two dipoles I've drawn here towards the O because O is more electronegative than H. And then the net dipole up through the center. Let's see. Oh, hang on. Let's go back a bit here. There we go. I also want to show you this one. This is NH3. And this is related to what we talked about earlier. Now, N is more electronegative than H. So you can see the three dipoles that we would draw along the bonds or towards the nitrogen. And then the net dipole straight up through the center of the molecule. And that's a little bit easier to see than what I was talking about earlier, especially with regard to these dashed and wedged lines here that I was discussing. So you can see that the wedge line here, see how the H is sticking out? And this H here is sticking into the page because it's got a dashed line. Does anybody have any questions about this? Now I want to show you what, what happens if we had a shape like this is called a seesaw shape. And you can imagine this is the bottom of the seesaw and these are the two ends of the piece of wood on the seesaw. So what happens here is that we can draw the dipoles along the SF bonds in each instance. And you can see here that when you've got two dipoles that are exactly opposite each other, those two are going to cancel. So the net dipole in, in that case is going to run directly through the middle here. I'm sure I show that at some point. There we go. That's the net dipole for SF4. It runs directly in between these two because these two end up canceling out. Why do they cancel? Because they're the same size and going in the, in the exact opposite direction. Does anybody have any questions? So note the same thing here for ClF3. We draw, F is more electronegative than Cl. So we draw the dipoles along the ClF bonds. These two cancel because they're going in the exact opposite direction. And we have one that goes along the ClF bond. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I'll go into that, that whole discussion there. And I show some other things as well. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what I can tell you. Does anybody have any questions? I think one other important thing I can tell you here. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry about that. Is that I've got these dipoles shown here. Let me uh, you can enlarge this a bit. So for every single one of those cases, I, I'm showing what the dipole is. Now, one thing you'll notice is that when there are no electron pairs, no non-bonding electron pairs, and this is important, no non-bonding electron pairs, the dipole is always zero. They always cancel out. So you can see that here, obviously, for the linear case, um, it's going to be zero because they're going to be exact opposite. And in the case of AX3, when the X's are in a trigonal planar, that also cancels as well. You'll see the same thing for tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, and octahedral over here. Yeah, everything cancels. So when, when there are no non-bonding electron pairs, the dipole is always zero. Now, the reverse isn't completely true because there are instances when you can have electron pairs and the dipole is zero, but there's no instances when you uh, have electron pairs. Let's, like, let's see, here's an example. Uh, this one here, trigonal, trigonal bipyramidal, but we have three non-bonding electron pairs. In that case, the dipole is zero. So all poodles are dogs, but not all dogs are poodles. I can tell you that if you have only X's, no, no lone pairs, you will always have a zero dipole. But if you have a zero dipole, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have all X's either. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. Just be aware that only that uh, logic only travels in one direction. Does anybody have any questions?
All right, let's take a look at how this is going to look on the test here for you guys. I really do recommend watching that dipole video. It's a good one. I think I really nailed that one. I think I did. I don't know. Maybe you'll agree. Maybe you won't agree. Maybe you'll get some, nah, he, he didn't nail that one. I don't know, but I think I did. All right. So can you all hear me still? Uh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right. Does anybody have any questions at all at this point before I start going through? Going through some stuff here. I'll tell you what, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this in two parts. I'm going to, first of all, show you what a question would have looked like on the on the pen and paper test because it it's helpful. Hang on. It's helpful to go through this in order because it's the same order as you'll see on the regular test as well. So let's, uh, let's go take a look. Uh, what are we looking at? Here we go. I'm going to pull this up here, test four. Hang on, let me try and get this organized here. not really cooperating with me. There we go. Okay. So let's take a let's take a look at the kind of question we're talking about. You'll notice I've waiting for this to finish doing what it's doing. Okay, so what I do is in this instance, I give one compound and then you do all these different things. And these are the same kinds of questions as you'll do on the test. The, the catch is it won't be all for the same compound, but I, I think it would be better at least for now to show you something where you, you are seeing the same compound. Okay, so let me see if I can get this to, to zoom in a bit here. So you can see these questions a little bit more clearly. There we go. All right, so the first thing we, we want to try and do is draw the Lewis structure for SBF4, three minus. Then we want to figure out what the bond angles look like. We want to be able to describe the shape of the atoms and the overall shape as well. And the hybridization. And we want to be able to see if it has a dipole moment or a net dipole. Okay, so those are the, the, the things that we have to be able to do. And the, the, the same things that you're going to have to be able to do as well. So let's go through this and in the same order and we'll see where we're at. Okay, so first of all, Lewis structure, and that's always what you'll have to do first anyway. SBF4, three minus. Okay, so what we do is first of all, we figure out the valence electrons so we can draw the Lewis structure. Now the valence electrons are going to be five for SB plus four times seven plus three. So the groupings here. The five is because we've got SB in group five on the periodic table, seven for the F because that's in group seven and there's four of those and then the plus three is for the negative three charge. Right? We've done this before. Does anybody have any questions about calculating the valence electrons? So if we look at that, that's four times seven, or just four times seven there, sorry about that. So five plus four times seven plus three is 36. 
So that's how many valence electrons we're dealing with. SB will be in the center. And then we'll put, now I'm not really worried about the shape now because I can't really determine that with the information I have presently. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to go ahead and put four Fs around the SB and then bond them to the SB. As a general rule of thumb, the single element will always be central and everything else will be connected to it. Does anybody have any questions so far? The next thing I'll do is satisfy the fluorines by giving them enough electrons to make sure they have eight. If I do that, then I count up all the electrons, I will have used 32. And I have a total of 36 to use. So that means I've got four more left and those four are gonna to have to be placed on to the antimony. So we, we did this, we talked about this earlier in, and this is a case where we have excess electrons and that's where the excess electrons are going to go. They're going to go on to that central element. So if I use that notation I talked about earlier, we've got A, which represents the central element. We've got four atoms attached, and then we've got two pairs of non-bonding electrons, and that's the E2 there. So AX4E2 is what I would call that. So if you look at, we're looking now for the overall shape, we wanna be able to describe the overall shape. That means what we have is there's six total electron groups or six total things that take up space. Six things that take up space. And if we go and look at, because you know, you'll have access to this on the test as well, this diagram here. You were looking for whatever the overall shape would be that would describe the situation where you have six things attached, right? So you, what you're really effectively doing is pretending that the electron groups are like atoms. So the overall shape of this SBF43 minus, is one other thing I'll do here as well, and I forgot to do this. Put it in square brackets, put a negative three on the outside as well. Sorry about that. So what you're looking at here for part A, the overall shape, or no, that's, sorry, part B, that's the, uh, part, part A was the Lewis structure. Part B, the overall shape is octahedral. Does anybody have any questions? So this chart will be available to us so we don't have to remember all the geometric shapes. That's correct, yeah. This okay. very chart, it, it'll appear in the test, okay? Okay. Now the shape of the atoms. So let's look at the shape of the atoms. This is where we take into account the electron pairs here. So we're looking for the diagram that will allow us to best express that. Let's see if we can find it. So it's the one that has four atoms and two non-bonding electron pairs attached. And there he is right there. You can see that's four atoms and the two non-bonding electron pairs. And that's the shape of, that's going to allow us to get the shape of the atom. So what I can do, even if I'm not particularly good at art, I can just copy what I have here. All right, so this is what this one's going to look like. So I'm just going to put the SB where the A is. I'll put the Fs where the X is, where the Xs are, I should say. There we go. And then the non-bonding electron pairs. So that's what the that's what the overall shape looks. Sorry, that's what the shape of the atoms looks like. And we call that square planar.
And because that's a square, it means all the bond angles are 90 degrees. Or you could also say that the bond angles are 180 as well, if you want to go across the, the central atom too. So 90 and 180 for the, the bond angles on that one. So what I want you to be able to appreciate here is the difference between those two concepts, the overall shape and the shape of the atoms. If there are no non-bonding electron pairs, the overall shape and the shape of the atoms will be one in the same. But when there are electron pairs, there's, a, there's it's going to be a different, it's, it is gonna be a different shape for the two. Remember the shape of the atoms, we talked about this the other day, is when we kind of ignore the lone pairs and we just look at the shape that the atoms are making. In this case, it's square planar. Does anybody have any questions? Nobody has any questions. I can't believe that. Either you all understand or you're all completely utterly lost. And I'm not sure which it is. I mean, the, the concepts there is just, I guess it takes practice in that sense. Cause I, I understand where it's going. It's just going to take practice, I guess. And it makes, it makes pretty good sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. You got the AX four E two because there's the four Fs and then you had two pairs left over. Two electron pairs here yeah. on, on the, on that central element. And okay. remember, those two pairs are a result of the fact we have to use all 36 balance electrons we calculated. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Okay, let's look at the hybridization here. Now, we already agreed that the overall shape was octahedral, six total groups. So the hybridization here, since we got six, six groups total, that means we need six hybrids. And those six hybrids will be made from six orbitals. So we would need S, three Ps, and two Ds. So each of those would be SP three D two would be the answer there. Does anybody have any questions? Just a brief reminder here about where I'm getting that from. All right, so here, the total groups, so you see hybridization is always based on the total groups, the overall shape. So octahedral is six groups, meaning we need six hybrids. So the hybridization will be made up of one S, three Ps and two Ds. We only have three Ps to work with, so we have to grab two Ds to make this hybrid work. Does anybody have any questions? <coughs> Excuse me. What are we doing here? Let's go back here. Because I was there. All right, let me get back to the question and I guess, okay. no, no. So the, the last thing we need to do once we've got the, the hybridization is we need to be able to draw a dipole moment. So that's going to be, that's, what, that's when this diagram is going to come back into play here. So I just draw, I'm just drawing that same diagram as I had before that showed the shape of the atoms. Oops. So 
So then I can draw my dipoles. Now F is more electronegative than SB. So we draw the dipoles along the SBF bonds. You'll notice I'm not going to draw any dipoles along the non-bonding electron pairs here. Now, because it's square and, and these are all 90 degrees apart, then effectively what happens is these dipoles will cancel. So the net dipole is really going to be zero here. And that's how I work it out. Does anybody have any questions? Pretty straightforward. All right, let's take a let's take a look at how this looks on the on the test you're going to take. Uh, practice test four, here we go. Preview. Okay, so as you can see on the on the practice test, Ron, you had, I think you had asked about this. You can see that you got this diagram here at the top. So that's your that's for your geometric shapes, All right? And then you've got your periodic table underneath that. Now we can get started after that. So it says draw the Lewis structure of SO two. How many double bonds are present? So these are. So these, these questions will just sort of test your ability to, to draw the, the Lewis structures. And you'll notice there's going to be two, two kinds of questions relate to that. One is for the SO, one is for the double bonds and one is for the lone pairs, lone pairs or non-bonding electron pairs. So I'll do both of those. So you notice there are always going to be two different, two different ones. So we're looking at SO2 first. So the valence electrons there is going to be six plus two times six, and that's 18. That's because both SO, S and O are in group six on the periodic table. I know the group numbers aren't placed here on the periodic table, but you can sit, you know you can put them in if you want to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. On the other one, eight, can't see it there. All right, so we've got SO2, let me see. So we know that it's going to be S and O bonded together once. And then we put in the electrons on the outside to make the oxygens happy. And we've used a total of 16 so far, if you count them all up. And that means there's two left over and those go on the sulfur. But the sulfur is not happy, the sulfur's only got six. So what we do is we make a double bond. And that gives the sulfur eight now, which is good. And there's your, there's your Lewis structure for SO2, and that one has a one double bond. Does anybody have any questions? Now you will remember, I, I talked about a, this is the other day, I talked about an exception to what can happen in this situation if the central element is a metal. If the central element is a metal, then we wouldn't have even bothered to make a double bond. We would have just left it the way it was. So that's the situation where something is electron deficient. The, the way you'll know is if the central element is metallic or non-metallic. But in all these questions that we talk about here, 
they're all non-metals anyway, so you know you really won't have to worry about it. But I'm just saying that's that's how you could tell. Does anybody have any questions? NO3 minus balance electrons. Five plus five plus three times six plus one. That's twenty-four. All right. Any any questions so far? The plus one is because of a negative charge, right? That we add one for the extra electron. It's creating a negative charge. And the N is in group six, five, and the O is in group six, and that's how we're getting that. Does anybody, anybody have any questions? Okay, so we do N and we do three O's. Again, I'm, I'm not really interested in shape right now. I'm just trying to, to get, a, get a handle on the little structure. Then I fix up the oxygens. And if I do this, you'll see that indeed I have used 24, but the, the nitrogen is not, is not happy. So again, I have to create a double bond. doesn't matter which oxygen shares them, but this again is to allow the and to be happy, have eight electrons. And I, ha I can't just put two electrons on there out of the air because I can only use 24. And that's what I calculated up here. All right, so the, the total Lewis structure looks like this with the square brackets and the minus on the outside. And then where, um, that's it. I mean, that's, that's the total thing. Now the number of lone pairs or non-bonding electron pairs we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this would have eight, eight lone pairs. The lone pairs are just the electron pairs that aren't involved in bonding. Eight lone pairs. Does anybody have any questions? Why did you have to do a double bond there? Because the N only has six. If you look at it here, do you see that? Yeah. Yeah, so it only has six. So I have to take get two electrons from somewhere. Now I can't just pull them out of the air. So what happens is the oxygen will actually share them with the nitrogen okay. and that produces that double bond. Is that fair enough? So it needs eight. It needs everything needs eight. Yeah. All right. And then that's and then you just take the two from there and make it the double bond to make it eight. Yeah. But Richard, the, the main thing I can tell you. You cannot use any more or any less electrons than what you calculate in the first step. That's why this first okay. step is so crucial. All right, does anybody have any questions? Okay. So the next one here, consider the compound NBr3 minus, we're looking for the NBr3 two minus, we're looking for the overall shape. Okay, so let's see. Well, it gets challenging, doesn't it? Mm. Okay, NBr three two minus. All right, I'm going to ask for a little bit of interaction here. I want you to calculate how many valence electrons there are, please. And further, I'm going to create a little poll for this one. So go ahead, go ahead and do that. I'll, I'll create a little poll. Valence electrons number. All right. Let's see. Hmm. Now I've got to work it out and make sure I come up with some answers here. All right. Okay, so I have an answer. All right. Was it BR3? Yes, that's right. But don't say anything yet. Okay. Don't say anything. 
because you're going to. No, we just can't see the problem. I know. No, yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. It'll come back. I promise. I promise it'll come back. Okay. Okay, let's go back to where we were at. See if it'll let me do the poll here. I'm going to figure out how to get this poll to come up. Hang on. Hang on. And I'll show you the question again, too. It's MBR32 minus, but I'll look. Let me get the polling here going. Here we go. All right. So you you, you now have the, the opportunity to, to vote here on which you think is the number of bounce electrons. I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come back here to it. Okay, so NBR three, two minus. I'd like everybody to have a go at it, please. No, I didn't think it was, I thought it was two plus. <laughs> oh, it's two. <laughs> might, affect, might affect my answer. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's likely, it's likely it will. Okay, I'll give you another I'll give you another 20 seconds or so, see if you can come up with an answer. I guess this lets me know how many people are actually interacting, how many people are actually sitting at their computer. So I imagine there's some people who've just got, got me on in the background. They're doing something else right now. Okay, we'll leave it at that. So I'm gonna end the poll here, but the correct answer is, is indeed 28. A lot of people said that, which is good. Um, share the results here. There we go. There we go. So you should um, you should be able to see the results of that. Can you all see the results? Yes. Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. Yeah. It's a good little feature at times. I don't mind it. All right, uh, NBR3, two minus the valence electrons, just working it out here to show you how to get 28. We got five plus three times seven. Oops. Three times seven, sorry. Times seven, there we go. Plus two. So that would be, yeah, that'd be 28. Does anybody have any questions at all about that? Let's go back to the question here. Okay. Now we need to we need to figure out the overall shape of this. And we've got our 28 electrons. So it's really important to do that first step. Otherwise, I, I don't really feel like it's possible for you to, to get this right. So what I do is I bond those three bromines to the nitrogen to begin with. Then I make the bromines happy. And once I've done that, that's a total of 24 electrons I've used so far. Is everybody okay with that? Is everybody okay with the fact that I've used 24 electrons up to this point? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so that means we've got four left over and two, two pairs will go on the nitrogen like this. So if I was to, to do that electron group thing, it'd be AX3E2. And what I would want you to see here is that it was this is a total of five groups. Three plus two is five. And if we look at the name of the one that has five groupings on it, that's this one here, trigonal bipyramidal. So that would be your answer. So to get the overall shape, remember what you're doing is you're pretending, you're pretending that the electron pairs are just like atoms because they take up space just like the atoms do. If you were asked for the shape of the atoms on this one, does anybody know what you'd pick? Let's see if I can draw it up, hang on. Let me pull this down here. 
Okay, which one do you think you'd pick? Is it T-shaped? It's T-shaped here, yes, because you can see you've got the three atoms, one, two, three, and then the two non-bonding electron pairs. So T-shaped would be the answer, if you were looking for the, for the shape of the atoms. Does anybody have any questions? Can you go over um, how you got the three and the two on the X and the E? Okay, do, well, are you okay with the Lewis structure here? Yes. Okay, so you got one, two, three atoms, right? That's the Xs. And then the two non-bonding electron pairs, that's your E's. Thank you. Is that all right? Yes, it's good. Okay, does anybody have any questions? <coughs> Sorry, it's not the rhino, I don't think. I hope not. Okay, what are we doing here? Uh, the next one, yeah. Consider the following compound, Cl31 minus, oh, this is a good one. We're looking for the, no, we already did the overall check. <laughs> Do that one. Just do this one. The shape of the atoms. This is for GABR three two minus. Okay. So GA is over here. GA is actually in group uh, group three. Okay, so the valence electrons here is going to be three plus three times seven plus two. Anybody any questions about that? So 21, there's 26, 26 valence electrons. Everybody okay with that? Anybody have any questions? All right, so we do our our diagram here is going to be GA. I'm going to attach three BRs to it. And then I will make my bromines happy. Now I've used a total of 24. And that means I've got two left over and those go on the central element like that. So that would be, put this, thing around, it's too negative. And I would call this AX3E. Right, so it's A with three atoms and then a non-bonding electron pair. Now we're looking for the shape of the atoms in this case. So we go back to our, our diagram here. So we're looking for AX3E. And I'm hoping you can see that it would be this one here. Trigonal pyramidal is what you'd call it. Three X's and then, then the non-bonding electron pair is here. So AX3E. And that will give us the that'll give us the shape of the atoms. Now the overall shape of this one would be tetrahedral. If you're asked for the overall shape, it'd be tetrahedral. For this one, the shape of the atoms is going to be trigonal pyramidal. Does anybody have any questions? Remember, when you're looking for the overall shape, you're pretending that the electron pair is like an atom. And it takes up space just like an atom does. So the overall shape will be determined by that. Any questions? Okay, let's look at the next one. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip the bond angle question. Let's look at, let's look at the hybridization here. So TeCl4. So 
So the valence electrons are going to be five T's in group, no, T's in group six, I'm sorry. Six plus four times seven. Okay, so that's 34 valence electrons. So I do TE and I put four chlorines around it. And I'll bond with the chlorines and then I'll put the electrons around the chlorines to give them eight. So at this point, I, I will have used 32, which means there's two left over and those go on the TE. So that would be A, X, 4, E. And what we're looking at here is five groups, five total, five total groups, which means I need a, a hybridization that reflects that and the one that does is sp3d because that that's the one that uses five orbitals s three p's and a d so that's going to be sp3d any questions see hybridization is not that bad you just let, you just have to look at how many total groups there are and then pick the one that has that same number of orbitals in the hybrid that's it it really isn't that bad any questions? Um, are you going to go over the degree ones or have you just not gotten? No, I guess I'll go back. I'll go back to it. Okay, I'll see. I just wanted to make sure I had time, okay? Richard, okay. But let, let, me, let me do the, the dipole then I'll go back to the degree ones, okay? Okay. So B, I as the dipole. Okay, so B and I, and you look at I, I is more electronegative than B, I believe. Hang on, I can pull this out, here we go. So yeah, yeah, so I, out of B and I, I is more electronegative than B. So any arrow is going to point towards the I. So in B, I, it's going to point to the right. So that will be your answer. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so this, in this question, you, you're actually given the Lewis structure and you, you're asked to figure out where the dipole goes. So you don't actually have to figure out any, anything here. You don't, have to, you don't actually have to get the, the structure right to get, this, to get this one. So what you would do is you'd want to be able to draw the dipoles in and I'll show you how to do that, of course. Now that, this, this thing here is a non-bonding electron pair at the top. Hopefully you can, you can see that. So the O is more electronegative than the P. So we draw our, our dipoles in along the PO bonds. And then we look at the two, they're basically going in a very similar direction towards the down direction. So the net dipole will go directly in between the two. And that direction is going to be more what I'm calling south. So it'd be this one. That would be the answer you'd put. Okay, does anybody have any questions about those? Okay, again, it's all practice and it's understanding how to visualize those dipoles. And that's why I recommend watching that video. I, I'd watch it over and over to understand the dipoles because you all can, it's not really that bad. All right, Michelle, I'm gonna go back, since we have time, I'm gonna go back to the degree questions here and we'll do ASF two minus. Now the degrees or the bond angles are all going to be determined by, by whatever shape we come up with for this. So ASF two minus, and again, we go through the same rigmarole of the valence electrons. It's going to be five plus seven times two plus one. That's 20. Okay, so AS 
And I'll draw in my Fs. I'm not interested in the shape because I really can't get the shape until I figure it out. Then I'll make the Fs happy. And if I do that, then what happens is I'll end up with, well, hang on, let me, I'll take those off now. If I make the Fs happy, then they've got eight each and I've used a total of 16. I've got four left over. So both of those make, a, make pairs on the AS. So that would be AX to E2 would be my, the way I'd express that. So I go back up here and I look for the shape so Richard, you can't do this without knowing the shape here. And AX2E2 is this one here, the angular one. So what I want to do is I want to try and draw that or emulate it a bit. Let me move this over. Yeah. So you've got AS and then you, the X's will be replaced by the F's and then the... Now the overall shape here is going to be tetrahedral. So overall is tetrahedral. Which means that all the bonds are 109.5. And that would be decrease C, I mean, just decrease. So 109.5 degrees, that, that would be the answer there. I think, Richard, what, what a good idea would be to, is to, to go back to that, that video where I show the bond angles. This is, I do have a whole video about that as well. And to understand where those bond angles come from and how you can just look at these. And what I mean by that is you can see that that's 180 on the linear. The trigonal is 120, that's 360 divided by three. Tetrahedral, you'd have to know, is 109.5. In the trigonal by pyramidal, that'd be 180. And then 120 for what's in the plane. Yeah, this is something I went over the other day. And then for this last one, octahedral, they're all 90 and 180. So it's all based on what you're seeing for the shape. So you can't really figure out the degrees unless you do the shape. Yeah, I, I get how you find them. It's just I didn't really understand how the tetrahedral one worked out too much, but it's just always 109.5. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I, I know how to find it. I just didn't know what the degree oh, okay. was. Okay, fair enough. But remember, this is multiple choice. So you know, if you know it's not 120, you know it's not 180, and you can see the other choice there, so then you don't have to remember. You see what I'm saying? See, they're all here. All right, any, uh, any, any other questions? Okay, I think this is a good place for us to stop today. And if you, if you need me, give me a holler. Remember, no, no class on Wednesday. Don't come to class on Wednesday. I won't be here. I have a question. Yes. So all those like little mini quizzes or whatever they're called in the test for those are not extra credit, right? Those are like for real grades. No, they're all extra credit. They're all extra credit as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the only thing for credit on this test here. Actually, let me make sure of something. I, I can't remember if I put a units quiz in here or not. I might have. I can't remember if I made the units quiz part of the grade. I need to check this. Yes, there's, oh, okay, units quiz, that's actually extra credit. Okay, cool, it's not part of the grade. All right, so there's also a units quiz too that you can do, that's for extra credit. So all these things here, and you can see the list here, see if that, you can tell it's 100. That means that there's nothing else there for the for credit and everything else here is extra credit. And you, you'll be able to see that when you go look at your grade report. 
Right, any other questions? All right. I'll see you all later. Thanks for coming. See you next week. Yep. Yeah, see you next next Monday. See you next week. Chloe, Ali. You can't, okay, fair enough, Chloe. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't see your, your chat here. Uh, degrees, well, it's not so much a matter of memorizing really. It's, it's looking, being able to look at the shape and being able to tell what the degrees are. I recommend you watch my video that goes through that and then you can more easily visualize the degrees. It's actually not that bad. Did you get that, Chloe? All right, thank you. Thank you, Chloe. All right, Ali, did you need anything? All right, thank you. All right, I'll see you all later. Okay, no worries, no worries, Chloe. Bye-bye.